Johnny, don't talk like that. Well, it's the truth. I'm fed up with it. Johnny. That's the only thing you ever understood. I'm through with it. Hello to all the classic people that are returning. I'm glad you're back. I want to welcome any new visitors and let you know that there will be spoilers ahead. Today on Classic Movie Review, we are taking on Scarlet Street, 1945. This is generally the part of the show where I thank people for their support, and I really do appreciate the comments and email. But today, I'm going to ask you for something. If you've not left a review for the show, please go to where you get your podcast and leave one. Also, if you like the t-shirts I wear in the videos, you can get one, or a mug, or a sticker at the link on my site. Thanks again. IMDB.com rates this movie at 7.8. RottenTomatoes.com rates this film at 100% on the tomato meter and 87% audience approval. New York Times film critic Bosley Crothers didn't think much of this film and said in a February 15, 1946 review, quote, now that the New York State censors have finished playing around with the film Scarlet Street, first they banned it and then passed it on appeal with minor cuts. The public may go to see and decide for itself just how damaging to its morals this picture may be. This being the case, we're not anxious to prejudice any sinners in advance, but we must sound this critical warning. It isn't likely to encourage a life of crime. For Scarlet Street, despite the title and all the lurid implications of the censor's ban, is a painfully moral picture and, in light of modern candor, rather tame. In this presentation, however, it seems a sluggish and manufactured tale, emerging much more from sheer contrivance than from the passions of the characters involved. And the slight twist of tension which tightens around the principal character is lost in the middle of the picture when he is shelved for a dull stretch of plot. And if it hadn't been tagged by the censors, it would have passed as an average thriller job. Actors. Right, and I'm a Shakespearean actor. One of my favorite, and I'm sure many of yours as well, Edward G. Robinson plays the kindly painter Christopher Cross. This great actor was first covered in the noir western The Violent Men, 1955. The bad boy of film noir, Dan Duryea played the ironically named abusive boyfriend, Johnny Prince. Duryea was first covered in the wartime propaganda film, Sahara, 1943. Rosa Niven played Adele Cross, the abusive and dictatorial wife of Chris. She was pretty good in this role. Ivan was first covered in The Verdict, 1946. Vladimir Sokolov had a small part as artist Papa de Jean. Sokolov was first covered in the Great Western, the Magnificent Seven, 1960. Joan Bennett was cast into the definitive femme fatale role of Catherine Kitty March. Bennett was born in New Jersey in 1910. Her parents were successful stage actors. Bennett never wanted a career as an actor, but she first worked on stage as a child. She started appearing in the films that her father was cast in, such as The Valley of Decision, 1916, and a few years later, she was in The Eternal City, 1923. Bennett married at 16, had a baby, and divorced in 1928. To support her daughter, Bennett began working in films again. Some of her movies include Power, 1928, Bulldog Drummond, 1929, Disraeli, 1929, The Mississippi Gambler, 1929, Three Live Ghosts, 1929, She Wants a Millionaire, 1932, me and My Gal, 1932, Little Women, 1933, and Trade Winds, 1938, where she changed from a bleach blonde to a brunette. This had a major impact on her career. The 1940s were Bennett's time to shine in film noir. These film noirs include The Woman in the Window, 1944, Scarlet Street, 1945, The Woman on the Beach, 1947, Secret Beyond the Door, 1947, Hollow Triumph, 1948, The Reckless Moment, 1949, and Highway Dragnet, 1954. Bennett was in two other important movies before she moved away from film for a decade. These films are Father of the Bride, 1950, and Father's Little Dividend, 1951. She took a role in the horror soap opera Dark Shadows from 1966 to 1971. Bennett was also in one of the series' movies. 
House of Dark Shadows 1970. Her last movie was an Italian movie, Suspiria 1977, and her last television appearance was Divorce Wars, A Love Story in 1982. Bennett died in 1990 at the age of 80. Story. Let me explain. No, there is too much. Let me sum up. The movie begins at night on a busy city street in 1934. Outside a fancy club, there's an organ grinder and his monkey. I believe this is a metaphor for Criss Cross, Edward G. Robinson's life. Inside the fancy club, they are having a black tie celebration for Chris. The boss, J.J. Hoggart, Russell Hicks, stands to leave, but before he does, he awards Chris a fancy jeweled pocket watch. Chris is getting the watch for 25 years of service as a cashier at the brokerage firm. J.J. gives Chris a cigar and lights Chris's cigar third off a single match. Chris crosses his fingers against the hex. The men all see the beautiful young woman in the car waiting for J.J. Chris, a shy man, leaves the party on his way back to Brooklyn. It is raining, and he uses his umbrella to keep his friend, Charles Pringle, Samuel S. Hines, dry. Chris tells Charles that he is lonely and has never had anyone look at him like the woman looked at J.J. Chris also says that he wants to be an artist and still paints every Sunday. Chris invites Charles to come see his paintings. The lonely Chris makes his way towards the subway. Under the elevated train, Chris sees a man viciously beating a woman. Chris charges in to save her using his umbrella on the attacker. The attacker falls to the ground. The lady is also on the ground and she rubs her jaw. She is Catherine Kitty March, Joan Bennett. Chris gets a beat cop, but the attacker has fled the scene. Kitty asks Chris to take her home. She lives above a small bar slash nightclub and Chris asks her into the bar for a cup of coffee. When they go inside, the bartender knows Kitty very well. Kitty asks the bartender if he has seen Johnny. Kitty orders a drink and insists Chris drink the same. Chris comments on how beautiful Kitty is. Kitty charms Chris. Look, uh, Kitty, uh, since I'm old enough to be your father, uh, You're not so old. You don't think so? Well, you're not a boy. You're just, uh, mature. I like mature people. And says she thinks he is an artist. Chris talks about his desire to own expensive paintings. Kitty thinks he is a very successful artist. When he pulls out his new watch, she really thinks Chris is loaded. Chris asks for her number, but Kitty says she doesn't have one. He asks if he can write, and she points to the building, saying, There's the address. When he asks who Johnny is, Kitty turns and flares at Chris. She says Johnny is her roommate Millie's boyfriend. Chris heads home, feeling on top of the world. When he gets home, he goes to the bathroom to paint the flower that Kitty handed him in the bar. He has true joy. When the doorbell rings, Chris's wife, Adele, Rosalind Ivan, begins screeching for him to answer the door. Charles has followed up on his earlier invitation to visit. Chris has to hide the invitation from Adele. Chris then has to clean the breakfast dishes for his wife. On the wall of their house is a huge picture of a man wearing a medal. When Charles asks about it, he is told it's Adele's late husband, Homer Higgins, Charles Kemper, who was a cop that died trying to save a woman drowning in the East River. Chris has been married for five years. He says she used to be sweet as he puts on a flowery apron to wash the dishes. The men go to look at Chris's flower painting that he's worked on all night. Chris's paintings are very abstract and interpretive. Adele comes into the bathroom in a slip. She screams about privacy. Where did you find a, a flower like that? Hmm. You mean, you see this when you look at that? Well, yes, uh, that is, I, I, I sort of feel it. Uh, you see, when I look at that flower, I see someone... Is there anything private in this house? The two men take the painting gear and retreat. Adele dumps the treasured flower into the trash. At Kitty's apartment, her boyfriend Johnny, Dan Durier, the same man who beat her up earlier, finds a letter from Chris. Johnny and Kitty get along fine. Johnny pulls out the letter and confronts her for writing a younger man. She explains that the letter is from Chris, the supposedly wealthy artist that knocked Johnny out. How come you're holding out on me, baby? Oh, stop talking about Saturday night. I'm not talking about Saturday night. I'm talking about this. 
Sounds like a schoolboy trying to make a date. You must be robbing the cradle. <laughs> What's so funny? You are. He's old enough to be my father. That's the old fellow who came to my rescue Saturday night. My hero. No kidding. Johnny is obsessed with Bunny. He says that since Chris is taken with Kitty, they should fleece him. Kitty is not interested at first, but Johnny has big dreams. Johnny pretends to leave, and Kitty is hooked. Millie Ray, Margaret Lindsay, Kitty's roommate, arrives, and she doesn't really like Johnny. Johnny leaves the two ladies alone. Millie is a model and she complains that Kitty hasn't worked since she met the abusive Johnny. Millie says Johnny is turning Kitty into a tramp. There is the illusion that she does a little prostitution for Johnny. Kitty meets with Chris for lunch in the city. Kitty asks if he will paint her picture. Why don't you paint my picture? I'd like to. Could I bring my easel to your apartment? Oh, I'm afraid my girlfriend wouldn't like that. How long does it take you to paint a picture? Well, uh, sometimes a day, sometimes a year. You can't tell. It has to grow. I never knew paint could grow. Uh, feeling grows. You know, that's the important thing, feeling. Chris continues to talk about painting and love. Kitty says she is broke and can't pay her rent. She drops the idea that if he pays for a studio apartment, he could paint there and she could live there as well. Chris confesses that he is a married man. Then Chris is shocked by the $500 ask from Kitty. Chris takes the money out of the cash box at the brokerage house. Then he quickly puts it back. Chris then goes to a loan agency, but they want a co-signer. At their apartment, Adele complains that Chris doesn't make enough money. She says she can't even have a radio and has to go to the neighbors to listen to her show. She talks to the picture of Homer. Both Chris and Adele complain that they are stuck. When he talks back, she thinks he is drunk. Adele still has the insurance money from Homer's death. She threatens to throw Chris's paintings outside. Adele calls him a pervert for what he paints. As she leaves, she orders him to do the dishes as she goes downstairs to listen to the radio show. Chris goes to the bedroom and finds the key to her dresser drawer. He opens the box of bonds. Adele comes in and almost catches him. The radio show has gone off the air and Adele is back to stay. Chris reads with joy about a man murdering his wife. Hey, uh, did you read this? Read what? Uh, this murder in Queens. A man killed his wife with a window weight, put a body in the trunk and shipped it to California. Uh, it says here- I've read the paper, thank you. He didn't get away with it, did he? He'll go to the chair as he should. Yeah, man hasn't got a chance with these New York detectives. Adele sends him out to wash the dishes of course, wearing the flowery apron. He tells her he will move his paintings to a friend's apartment. Kitty and Johnny go to rent the apartment for $150 a month. It is not long before the cad Johnny makes himself at home. One day, he is woken by a bell. Women's clothes and cigarettes are strewn all over the floor. He helps himself to the contents of Kitty's purse. She comes from the other room and is apparently hung over. Johnny has spent most of her money. He keeps digging and he finds her hidden stash in a compact case. Johnny wants her to get more money from Chris. He proposes blackmailing Chris about being married. Someone knocks on the door. Kitty cleans up a little before opening the door. It is Millie. Millie calls Johnny out of his hiding place. Millie and Johnny spit hate back and forth. There's another knock on the door. This time it's Chris with some of his painting stuff. Johnny is introduced as Millie's boyfriend and plays the role for Chris's benefit. Chris seems to recognize Johnny, but he can't place him. Chris doesn't like Johnny. Kitty flirts with Chris as he talks about what it would be like to not have a wife. Kitty complains that she needs more money, being a poor actress. Kitty says she will borrow the money from Johnny, and Chris says he will get the money for her. He tries to kiss her. Chris has to hurry back to work. When Chris leaves, Johnny is hiding behind the stoop. Kitty and Johnny don't understand Chris's artwork. I don't get it. The poor sap must be a hophead seeing snakes on the L. Imagine anyone paying money for this stuff. Say, are you sure he's not a phony? Ah, uh, he's too dumb to be a phony. Kitty complains that she doesn't like to be touched by other men and that Chris is too nice to her. Johnny wants to sell some of the paintings. 
Chris works late so that he can take money out of the cash box. He is almost busted by JJ. However, the boss is just cashing a check. Johnny goes to the pawn shop to try and sell two paintings. The pawnbroker says the paintings belong in Washington Square with the long-haired artist. Johnny finds an artist wearing a beret, Pop Lejean, Vladimir Sokolov. Lejean says that they have an odd perspective, but there is something there. He says he will sell them for $25 each. Johnny refuses to leave his contact information. Johnny meets with Kitty in a bar. She has previously given him $900. He got a watch, but he didn't retrieve her hawk diamond ring. He also hits Kitty because he thinks Chris is lying about the painting. Johnny returns to LeJohn and finds out that the paintings have been sold to modern art expert David Janeway, Jess Balker. LeJohn goes to the phone to call Janeway. Johnny runs away. Back at the apartment, Johnny and Kitty fight over what to do now that they know the paintings are valuable. Someone knocks on the door. It is LeJohn, Janeway, and another art dealer named Della Rowe. Johnny is hiding, but LeJohn sees other paintings and runs inside. LeJohn sees Johnny and tries to pay him off for the paintings. Janeway and Della Rowe say the paintings are good, and he wants to know who the artist is. What is it you want? We'd like to find out who painted the pictures. You don't know? Of course they don't know. That's what we're here for. Look, if you're a friend of the painter, you will put Mr. Delaro in touch with him. Why'd you buy those pictures if you don't know who painted them? Because they're good. Who painted them? No, Johnny, no. Oh, don't be so modest, Miss March. Now you see, you got me in bed. Johnny says Kitty is the real artist. The art experts say the work is strong and they thought the artist was a man. Johnny tells Kitty to act the part of an artist. Della Rowe wants all of the paintings. Janeway talks to Kitty, and she acts the part using the words of Chris. Janeway acts a little sweet on Kitty, and Johnny only thinks about the money. The artist leaves. Johnny tells Kitty to do what is needed to get Janeway. When she objects, he gives her a slap. Johnny is having Kitty sign the painting when Chris shows up unexpectedly. Chris is shocked to find Johnny in the apartment. Johnny leaves, but Chris is showing the green-eyed monster. Chris asks Kitty if Johnny is the one man that she says she has slept with. Kitty storms out. Chris is so upset he can't paint, and he tries to make peace with Kitty. She is getting dressed to go out. Kitty comes out in a robe and apologizes. He proposes to her, and she replies that he is already married. He then asks if he can paint her. She hands him a bottle of nail polish and extends her feet, saying, Paint me, Chris. Chris's paintings are hung in the window of the Della Rowe Art Gallery. Adele walks by and sees the paintings. She inquires about the artist and is told it is Catherine March. Chris is wearing the apron and cooking when Adele gets home. The first question she asks is how long he has known Catherine March. He thinks he's been caught. But Adele only thinks he has been copying the style from Kitty. Adele says Kitty is getting $500 a picture and she calls her husband a thief for stealing the style. Kitty complains about having to date Chris. Johnny only sees the money and doesn't care what she has to do. Suddenly, Chris bursts into the apartment. Johnny hides in the closet. Kitty cries and says she had to sell them because she needs more money. Chris is happy that his paintings sell, even under Kitty's name. Chris says he wants to paint Kitty's picture. Johnny sneaks out. He says the picture will be called Self Portrait. Della Rowe has an exhibit with all of Kitty's paintings. She is becoming the toast of the art world. Even the self-portrait is excellent. Greenway says in this column that she seems like two different people. A detective comes to see Chris outside of his work. When he goes outside, a man with an eye patch and a shabby suit is waiting. He identifies himself as Homer, Adele's late husband. Homer said he had been taking bribes from local speakeasies. He was being investigated. When a woman jumped into the river, he went after her. He grabbed what turned out to be the woman's purse, which contained $2,700. Homer grabbed a coal barge and then a banana boat for Honduras. Homer wants money and thinks Chris wants to stay married to Adele. Chris says he will get the man some money if he will wait until after work. Johnny and Kitty show up in a new convertible. Johnny gets a bucket of ice and an ice pick from the local vendor. After work, Chris brings $200 to Homer. Chris tells about the insurance money. 
He wants Homer to come and take the money when Adele is away from the house. At 11 p.m., Homer arrives outside of Chris's and Adele's apartment. Chris lets him inside to steal the bond. All the lights are off as he leads Homer to the bedroom. Chris runs away as he hears Adele screaming about the night assault. Chris goes to the apartment and finds Kitty and Johnny kissing and having a good time. Chris drops his suitcase and runs away. Johnny is really rude to Kitty and says he is through with her. He gives her another slap before he leaves. Push you over on your head. How'd I know he was coming here tonight? I don't understand. You don't understand anything. Well, why get sore at Well, what use are my brains if I'm tied up with a dumb clerk like you? I told you to watch your step, didn't I? That's right. Blame it on me. Oh, why'd you keep me here tonight? I didn't want to stay. Johnny, don't talk like that. Well, it's the truth. I'm fed up with you. Johnny. That's the only thing you ever understood. I'm through with you. Chris is in the bar drinking. He hears Kitty saying, I love you, over and over again to Johnny. An anti-drinking rally talking about sin sets Chris thinking. Kitty calls around trying to find Johnny. Millie says Johnny was saying that he was coming back to beat Kitty. She hears someone coming inside and she calls for Johnny. Chris walks in and confronts her. She says she loves Johnny. Chris says he is free and asks Kitty to marry him. He thinks she is crying, but she is laughing. She calls him an idiot and ugly and old. Why'd you come here? To ask you to marry me. What about your wife? I haven't any wife. That's finished. For cat's sake, you My husband don't... turned up. I'm free. <laughs> oh, now, <laughs> don't cry, Kitty. I know how you feel, but that's all over now. I'm not crying, you fool. I'm laughing. Kitty. <laughs> oh, you idiot. How can a man be so dumb? Kitty. I wanted to laugh in your face ever since I first met you. You're old and ugly and I'm sick of you. Sick, sick, sick. Kitty, for heaven's sake. You killed Johnny? I'd like to see you try. Why, he'd break every bone in your body. He's a man. You don't want to marry me? You? Get out of here. Get out. Chris picks up the ice pick and stabs Kitty to death. <laughs> the drunken Johnny slams into a hydrant as he arrives. Chris leaves and takes his suitcase. Chris hides by the stairway as Johnny breaks into the building. The next morning, the newspapers highlight the ice pick murder of the famous artist. Chris is a shell of himself. Two police officers arrive and Chris is taken to JJ's office. Chris thinks he's being arrested for murder, but it turns out it's for the $1,200 he stole to give Kitty. JJ decides not to press charges against Chris. JJ knows it was a woman that he stole for. Chris is fired from his job of over 25 years. Johnny is picked up by the cops and accused of murdering Kitty. Johnny has been caught with her car, her money, and her jewelry. His fingerprints are on the ice pick as well. Testimony is heard, and it's all against Johnny, especially Millie saying Kitty said, hello, Johnny, during the phone call. Yeah, he was mean when he was drunk. He said he was going to fix it when he left my place around 2 a.m., and then I heard her say hello Johnny before she hung up. He was there all right. What I don't understand is this talk about her being an artist. I never saw her paint. Mr. Cross paint? <laughs> the only copy to work. He's a thief. He stole from me, from his employer, from Catherine March. Adele and Chris both testify that Chris copied Kitty's painting. The newspapers show that Johnny is being executed at Sing Sing Prison. Chris is riding on a train that day and men from the press recognize him. They begin discussing the case, and one of the reporters says, no one gets away with murder. If you murder someone, you're carrying that crime in your heart for the rest of your life. Johnny is in the death cell with a priest when the cops take him for execution. Johnny denies the killing to the end. I didn't do it. I tell you, I didn't do it. Won't anybody believe me? Give me a break, somebody! I never had a square deal in my life! Chris is living in a small, dank flat. The lights flicker at the time of the execution. Chris begins to hear Kitty and Johnny's voices as they talk lovingly to each other. It's like he has seen a ghost. He hears Kitty mocking him for wanting to marry her. Guilty over having murdered two people, Chris hangs himself from a lamp. Two neighbors break in and save Chris. Chris still hears Kitty professing love to Johnny. Years later, sleeping on a park bench in the winter, Chris is rousted by a couple of cops. After Chris leaves, one cop says Chris has been confessing to the murder of Kitty and Johnny for over five years. Chris walks down the street 
and he sees his self-portrait of Kitty being sold for $10,000. Chris continues down the street with no wife, no job, no home, and no painting career. He still hears Kitty's voice talking to Johnny. Conclusion. Oh, that's not right. No. This movie is based on a French novel, La Chenet, translated as The Bitch or the Dog, by George de la Fouchadere. Ebedebede, you butchered that. The novel is the basis for the film Le Chenet 1931, directed by Jean Renault. Director Fritz Lang had previously worked with these three main stars, Edward G. Robinson, Joan Bennett, and Dan Duryea, in the very similar The Woman in the Window, 1944. Robinson played a lover of art in this film. In fact, he owned an extensive art collection and was considered an expert in this medium. Twelve pictures were painted by John Decker for the film. They were exhibited in the Museum of Modern Art in 1946. Ben Mankiewicz of TCM is quoted as saying local censors in some major American cities said the film was, quote, licentious, profane, obscure, and contrary to the good order of the community, unquote. The attempted suicide by Chris was not shown to avoid problems with the production code or Hayes Code as it was known. Bosley Crothers mentioned some of this in his newspaper reviews. The censors eventually rationalized that although Chris murdered Kitty and let the innocent, at least for murder, Johnny be executed. Chris falls into loneliness, poverty, and insanity, and that was punishment enough. Finally, a little film noir booze information. When Kitty moves into the studio apartment, her old roommate Millie brings over a three-sided bottle of scotch. This is probably a bottle of dimples or pinch. These bottles have appeared in other drinking-oriented films, such as The Thin Man, 1934, where it's Nick's favorite brand. It's also referred to as Dimple Scotch in The Lost Weekend, 1945. World-famous short summary, a pretty face don't mean no pretty heart. This show is now completely free and independent, brought to you without external ads. If you've enjoyed the show, please subscribe and leave a review where you get your podcast. It really helps the show get found. As a technical note, references and citations are listed for each show on the site at classicmoviereb.com. There is a lot of other information on the site, especially about film noir. Beware the Moors. <laughs>